Hello everybody, this is Danny from Deep South Homestead. I wanted to take just a moment to, today to talk to you about a topic that we seem to get a lot of questions about. And, and it is rightfully so, because one of the biggest mistakes I see more people making is how they save seeds. Uh, it's, it's, it's really key to survival. If you're going to survive anything that's coming, you really need to know how to save seeds and do it right. And I guess the one thing that I see is we have a lot of backyard gardeners, uh, a lot of people in you know rare, very uh, suburban type situations and settings, and they have very limited space, but yet they want to save their seeds. Well guys, I'm just gonna be honest with you, when it comes to saving seeds in a small place, you're going to have to be really, really careful because you've got neighbors right across the fence from you. If they're doing the same thing, I mean, you're really, you're really pushing your luck. Uh, now, if you're out in a rural area, it's not such a big deal as long as you do your seed saving responsibly. Uh, and I'll give you, for instance, like if you're trying to save seeds from heirloom tomatoes and you've got a garden, uh, let's say a 40 by 50 garden, and you want to save two or three varieties of heirloom tomato seeds, you know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you're going to have to save, you, you're going to have to plant one variety if you want to save the seeds. Tomatoes need to be at least 100 feet apart to even come close. It really need to be further than that, but at least 100 feet apart in order to be able to save seeds. And most lots in, uh, that's in suburban areas are, are not much bigger than 100 and something feet. Uh, so it makes it, it makes it difficult, and that's what I'm trying to, I guess, trying to make a point on. Uh, now, when it comes to different things like squashes and cucumbers and uh, pumpkins and things like this, and uh, beans, uh, whether they be pole beans, whether they be bush beans, different things like this, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do a little bit of homework. You're going to have to be able to look up the genus names of all of these different, uh, different things that you're planting. If the genus names are completely different, then you don't have to worry about cross-pollination, especially in things like beans and peas uh, and things to this nature, or pumpkins and squash. As long as you're in a different uh, genus name, then you don't have to worry about cross-pollination because sometimes some of the worst tasting vegetables that you can end up with is when you plant uh, two different plants, but they're of the same family, genus family, and they cross-pollinate and, and, and you save the seeds from them and you replant them. It may look like what you originally started with, but the taste could be utterly horrible. You know, and, and that happens lots of times. I mean, here at Deep South Homestead, we had a, we had a homestead, well, it wasn't a homestead box. It was like a, a box that was being passed around from person to person. And in it was some white patty pan squash seeds. And I told Wanda, I said, hmm, I'll try these, you know. I planted them and it made the most ungodly looking squash I've ever seen in my life. The thing was, you know, patty pans are supposed to be thin and flat and, you know, round like a sunburst. This thing ended up being about six or eight inches long, had a big old, look like a gourd on one end, you know, and I, I just threw it away and pulled the plant up. I said, well, there's somebody who thought they were saving the seeds right, and, and they weren't. You know, and I didn't know who it was because it was just in a box. It was just being passed around. But that happens all the time. Now, corn is another big one. People go, I want to save my, you know, I want to save my corn. Well, now, if you're just planting one variety of sweet corn and you want to save it, that's fine. You just let it go to seed, let it dry on the stalk, pick it when it's dry, and you'll be fine. But now, if you're planting sweet corn and field corn side by side, lots of times the sweet corn will tossle before the field corn does, so it's still okay, but you got to make sure they're not tossling at the same time. Now, uh, field corn especially, field corn can pollinate up to a quarter of a mile or a mile from where it's at. So you've got to really be careful with planting field corn. Now, uh, my Danny corn, uh, I've, I've, I've created this corn probably now, it's been probably 26, 27 years ago. Uh, I would actually take, 
And when I pollinated an ear, I would take the, the tassel off and pollinate a particular ear from one variety of corn to another variety and then put a bag over it so that I knew no other pollination got to it. And then I would save the seeds from that one and I would keep crossing until I finally created this particular corn that we have now that I call Danny corn. And I don't remember now exactly how many varieties it was. It's like six or seven varieties I used over a period of several years to actually create this corn and get it down to where it now comes back true to itself. Uh, but I did it. If y'all seen the video where I talk about it, I did it for, for cattle purposes because the corn we was using was too hard on our teeth. This corn is a dent corn and it's very easy on the cow's teeth. Uh, and it's even now beginning to revert back a little bit more than what it originally was because when I keep replanting the same seed over and over and over, I'm beginning to notice some characteristics in some of the ears of the uh, what's called tooth corn, which is the ancient corn. Now, some of it's actually reverting back to that. Uh, some people call it a gourd seed corn, a Texas gourd seed corn, uh, but an Iroquois Indians had... Uh, had a corn called a tooth corn and it's actually some of it reverts back to look like that because I actually have some of that corn in storage right now that I had to really pay a lot of money to get but you know and it's like there's just lots of different things that goes into saving seeds if you're planting a, a small garden and you've got uh, tomatoes uh, beans or squash and you've got okra and you've got two or three varieties in that one little garden there's no need saving your seeds, I'm just going to tell you, unless they have different genus names because they will cross-pollinate and you'll end up with a hybrid. You know, and so that's just something that you just have to come to terms with. If you're going to save seeds, then you got to plant just one variety in a small area of a particular thing. Like we plant Amish paste. When we plant Amish paste here, I plant nothing but Amish paste in my garden up here. Now, if I want some uh, celebrities... I go all the way back to my cabin, 10 acres back there, and I plant celebrities back there because I don't want them to cross-pollinate. And bees fly long distances. I mean, wind pollinates a lot of your tomatoes. You can use, uh, they're, to they're pollinated right at each other. But insects can go from tomato plant to tomato plant and actually carry the pollen. So that's the reason I recommend 100 feet on tomatoes or further if you've got the land. Uh, just, just to be safe. Let's just put it that way. Uh, you know... Uh, beans and peas are the same thing. You know, okra is the same thing. Okra can pollinate up to long distances uh, because of bees going from flower to flower. Uh, I had some problem with that years ago. Uh, I was trying to save a couple of varieties and I had them uh, in one garden and I had like uh, a couple hundred feet over. I had another garden over here and they actually crossed. When I planted that second okra back that second year, I actually ended up with a cross and I had to just do away with them. But, you know, within, there's just lots of ways, guys, about saving seeds. Now, like these, here I have my Cherokee tan. Now, this Cherokee tan, I would cut into it and take the seeds out of it. Well, first of all, I'll put them in a little container of water for a couple of nights. Because they've got the, the, uh, the stringy stuff all over them. That's a layer around. It's a protective layer around the seed. I'll put them in some water for a couple of days and then I'll go by every so often and take my fingers and squish them around in there and it gets that coating off of the seeds. And then once I have that off, then I'll pour the water off and have nothing but the pure seeds. And I'll take just some old cheap paper plates like this and I'll spread those Cherokee tan pumpkin seeds around and spread them out where they dry good. And then once they dry, I'll go through and pick out the ones that I don't think are worthy of pollinating. If I don't think they're any good, I'll just get rid of them. And the same thing with the, the spaghetti squash is, is in the same family, really. Um, they, uh, I, I save them exactly the same way. Tomato seeds, people ask me about saving tomato seeds. I have a video up about saving tomato seeds. And I, I scoop the tomato seeds out because they have a protective coating around those seeds. What it does is that coating actually prevents that seed from coming up for almost up to a year. It's for, so that it preserves the seed throughout all the winter months so that as time goes on it decays and breaks down so that next season that seed is viable and ready to go. But you can actually do that process yourself by putting tomato seeds in a little container of water 
and letting it actually ferment. It takes about three days for that to happen, but a, a, a skim will, film on, will fill on top of the water and it'll actually begin to mold and it sometimes stinks pretty bad. But you have to take a, something and stir it up every so often to beat that uh, coating off of those seeds. And the, and the viable seeds will float to the bottom. Any bad seeds will come to the top along with that heavy old skimmed up stuff that stinks really bad. And then you pour that off. I wash them, pour it off, wash them, pour it off. I do that several times. And then I take the tomato seeds and spread them out on a paper plate like this. Don't do them on napkins or paper towels because if they get stuck to them, won't come off. Take your paper plate or a styrofoam plate and spread them out on it and let them dry. That's one of the better ways. I mean, I have videos on saving asparagus seeds up. There's just a, a numerous different ways to save seeds. Corn, like here you see some of my corn, uh, I have some seeds off, some I don't. I, I take my time and I go around this ear of corn and my thumb and I break those seeds off looking at each individual seed to see if I see any insect damages or any weird shaped seeds or anything like that. And then once I shell them all out into something, I put them in a bag and put them in a deep freeze for two weeks to kill any weevil eggs or any other type of eggs that might be in insect eggs. I just kill them. And that way, if we decide to make uh, cornmeal, corn flour out of them, or if we save them for planting or anything like that, I don't have to worry about any insect eggs in them because they're pretty much, you know, pretty much dead. And we don't have to be worried about them trying to store them and then something hatching out and eating them up inside the container that we have. And I've, I have had that happen before uh, from some corn seed I got from people and I would set it up and not think about putting it in the freezer because I always put mine in the freezer and then I go back to, like a few weeks later and it's just a sifted powder in there. They've just nut the holes in there. They, you know, the insects and weevils have come out and eat it all up. Uh, you you want to freeze your peas and beans also. Now peas are worse than beans. But you always want to freeze your peas for a couple of weeks because peas have worms in them. Uh, your dry peas do, like black-eyed peas or uh, southern field peas and stuff like that. They all have worms in them, and you want to be able to uh, freeze those to kill anything in them so that you don't have to worry about the worms coming out and eating them up when you try to store them. Now, uh, I want to try to cover as much as I can on, on about saving seeds. Yeah, but the, the key things is distances, making sure the proper distances is, is observed, making sure you the genus names are not compatible with one another. These are two of the biggest issues right there with saving seeds uh, that I can actually think of as a seed saver myself because I've saved seeds my whole life. And a lot of people says, well, is there any good literature out there about saving seeds? Well, I have a book here that uh, I bought this book many years ago. It's, it's by Stories. Uh, it's a gardening skills book. It's about seed sowing and saving seeds. It's a, it's a really good book. Uh, I don't actually know. Uh, I mean, when I bought this book, this was a $20 book many, many, many years ago. I have no idea if it's even still in print today. But it's uh, by Stories, Gardening Skills. It's seed sowing and saving. Step-by-step -step techniques for collecting and gardening and more than 100 vegetables and flower seeds and all is in this one book right here. It's really a really good book to have uh, for beginners. Uh, and, and even me occasionally, I'll go look at it uh, just to see if there's a particular uh, vegetable or something that I'm trying to grow that I have not grown before and I want to, and I want to test it out. Now, we save a lot of uh, turnip seeds. Uh, we save a lot of our mustard seeds and stuff like that. We get heirloom varieties. And that some of those can be kind of tricky uh, because you got to let them dry on the plant really to be really successful at it. And then you have to, what I do is put them in a big number three wash tub about this big around. I take my hands and crush them all up. And then I, I, I sift them through a screen. And then after that, I winnow them. Uh, with a fan sitting in front of me to blow the chaff out in order to get my seeds for planting for the next year. Now, there's some plants that are called biennials. They are a lot harder uh, to work with because it takes two years. Uh, a lot of your onions, uh, your carrots and stuff like that are two-year plants. In other words, they don't make seeds until the second year of their life. And 
that makes it a little bit difficult, uh, especially if you're limited on gardening space. Now, when it comes to saving seeds on something like that, usually what I'll do is I'll put those types of things in containers. Something that I, I can just take care of the container, it doesn't matter. It's not taking up any garden space, it's just a container sitting out to the side somewhere and I'm able to harvest it. I'm able to keep it away from everything else and if need be I can take the tractor and a, and, and a pallet with my forks and I can pick it up and move it if I, if I suspect it's getting too close to something. And that's really one of the benefits to container gardening and saving seeds. Uh, now there has been times where I've planted some different varieties of greens in my garden and they go to seed and I really need to till my garden but I'm like man I really need to save those seeds too. I'll actually take a shovel and dig up a big clump of dirt and put it in a container and not disturb the roots on it and actually move the container off over by the shop or somewhere like that because it's done flowered, it's done pollinated and I'll just let it sit and grow and continue to seed and I'll save my seeds that way, especially with things like collards and uh, uh, mustard greens and different things like that that I'm actually trying to save some seed from. Uh, you know, it's really, there's really a it's really simple to be honest to, with you about saving seeds, but it's also very complicated. There's lots of people I see saving seeds, or they, they message me and say, you know, I'm saving seeds on this, I'm saving seeds on that, and I've got a small backyard garden, and I'm like, you know, I want to just say something so many times, but I usually keep my mouth shut. Um, because sometimes the best way is just to learn, but I also hate to see people lose a year's worth of growth. Actually, you lose more than a year. Especially if you are saving those seeds and sharing them with other people. Now, I guess that's the part that's really the worst part, is not knowing how to do it right and then sharing those seeds. But now, let me say this. In defense of all that, sometimes when you have two different heirlooms growing and they cross-pollinate and you save the seeds and you plant them, Sometimes you end up with a different type of tomato. Let's say, well, I'm using tomato for instance. You'll end up with a different type of tomato that has some of the best of both worlds from those two plants. And you end up with a hybrid variety that is just outstanding. The bugs don't mess with it. It has a great taste. It has a great shape. You know, I mean, sometimes, I mean, that's how hybrid is made. Let's just get honest about it. Uh, sometimes it can turn out and be a blessing. I have done that before and ended up with some varieties of the, just I call them my varieties, that literally are some of the best tomatoes I've ever raised. Most disease resistant, bugs don't mess with them and stuff, and, and it's just amazing. You go like, wow, what do I call this tomato, you know, or, or what do I call this plant? Uh, I have peach trees that are that way. I've created some peach trees that are my very own peach trees, and I just, I just name them what I want to name them because they're my peaches. And guys, that's the whole thing about it. Saving seeds can be, it can be a challenge, but yet it can be very fun to see. Sometimes if you don't mind having a hybrid and you don't mind seeing what you come up with and you got the time and the space, you know what? Sometimes it's going to be just very interesting to see what a tomato turns out to be if you cross two different varieties. And you go like, well, I just wonder what they'll be when they, you know, and you save the seeds and next year you plant them and you're allowed to come up with something and you go, wow, you know, this is awesome. And it, that's the joy that goes along with saving seeds. It doesn't always have to be a humdrum thing. You don't always have to be so meticulous. Sometimes you can just have a little fun with it. But if you're looking to save a particular line of seeds, then you need to be really discreet about it. Like our Cherokee tan here. You know, I did the video on it here the other day about the history of this particular pumpkin here. How it dates back to the 18... We know it goes back to the 1830s and 1850s without any cross-pollination. Uh, it's from the original stock. And this is a true pumpkin. True to itself. It doesn't have the characteristics of any other pumpkin. It's true to itself because it's been isolated and taken care of through all those years. And here, I plant them so far away from everything else and I don't plant anything near them that can cross-pollinate with them. And they have always remained true to themselves. And they're, they're very shelf-stable. You know, same thing, 
these spaghetti squash. Now this is a hybrid. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a small spaghetti squash. We, we wanted the little ones because they uh, we don't eat a lot at one time. This one squash will give me a couple of three meals off this one squash here. But because it's a hybrid, I, if I save the seeds, I'm not going to get that true spaghetti squash back. Now I'll get a spaghetti squash back, but I don't know what it'll taste like. You know, so uh, sometimes I may save a few seeds and just find a particular place on my property because it's large enough and I'll just stick them in the ground and we'll just see how it turns out. I mean, I do those things occasionally just to see what I end up with. And sometimes, like I said, it can be fun. You'd be amazed at what you end up with. The guys i have sitting here, you know, it's been raining today a little bit. The weather's been kind of nasty and I've uh, been in the shop a lot. I've been out of the cabin a lot working and I had to come in for a moment while it was raining. I was just like, I need to, and, and I got to reading comments on a lot of my YouTube videos. Because I go back a lot of times to our past videos and just pick up some of the comments that I didn't get a chance to answer back then. And I'll answer them. And I got to noticing an, an awful lot about saving seeds. And, and that's rightfully so. Uh, because it's really a big deal. If we're going to be self-sufficient as much as possible and grow our own food, and in the event that we can't get seeds, then we need to know how to save our own seeds because that is a big deal. Uh, now, me personally, I've bought up tons of hybrids that are very disease-resistant in lots of other ways. I have tons of uh, heirloom seeds that I have uh, just to plant in specific places on my property. Uh, now there are some seeds that don't need to be put in water. Let me say that, uh, like like we was talking about, like the the, the Cherokee tan can be put in water, uh, the spaghetti squash can be put in water, tomato seeds can be put in water to get that protective coat off of them. Uh, cucumber seeds can be done the same way, but things like pepper seeds, uh, you can take them right out of the pepper as long as you let the pepper mature. The, you, you don't need to do it with a green pepper. You need to wait till the pepper turns red, and you need to be able, or yellow, whatever the variety is, or orange, or whatever it is, and you take the seeds out of it, just scatter them out on a paper plate, and just let them dry. You don't have to put peppers or anything like that in water. They can just be spread out on a sheet like that and just let dry. Um, I, I, I think that I've pretty much covered the most of the different varieties. Uh, things like sunflower seeds, you can just shell them out and just let, lay them out on a plate too like this. Uh, they'll dry uh, dry uh, corn. Like we said about it, it needs to be shelled out once it's dry. Don't do it while it's green. Make sure it's good and dry. When it's good and dry, you won't have any question about it. When your thumb touches it like that, it just falls right off in your hand. If you got to sit there and work to pull that corn off of that ear, it's not dry enough. And you put the seeds up, they'll actually mold on you. So you got to be careful. Uh, corn's one of the things, and peanuts are, is another one that you have to watch out about alpha toxin. Now alpha toxin is a poison that can get on these. It's like, a, it's, like a, it's like a mold that gets on them, a fungus, let me put it that way, a bacteria that gets on them that will make you really, really sick. Now, that's one thing about saving corn for grinding for your own personal use. You have to make sure it's really good ears and you have no alpha toxin on it whatsoever. Now there are tests that can be ran. And the thing about it is when you go to buy corn, to grind uh, the uh, the powers to be. Let me say that I'm not going to use the actual word. The powers to be that judges our food systems says that a certain amount of alpha toxin is allowable in food sources. Uh, well, me, I don't want any in my system, you know, because it's, alpha toxin is extremely dangerous, and so I, I take really special precaution to make sure that I don't get any corn that looks like it has anything like that on it. And uh, peanuts, we try to, we do raise some Virginia fancies here, but the jungle peanuts don't have a problem with alpha toxin. They don't have that fungus on them. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that with the jungle peanuts. So those are a few things, guys. I, uh, I can't think of anything else to talk about, about saving seeds. Um, unless you're saving potatoes or something like that, then, you know, they need to be kept in a cool, dry place over winter so that you can actually have them to plant next year. Uh, you can save blemish-free, disease-free uh, potatoes. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't guess I can think of anything else. 
right off the top of my head. I mean, things like watermelons and all, they can be dried on a plate just like this. Once the watermelon is mature, you uh, cut it open. As long as it's an heirloom variety, you can save it, uh, save the seeds from it. Um, uh, we talked about onions and carrots or biennials. I can't really, I can't really think of anything else that um, that would be anything that we would plant on a regular basis. You know, most of us. Uh, so, guys, I hope that today I answered a lot of the questions that's been asked to us on our uh, videos about seeds, saving seeds, and how to do it about planting seeds where they don't cross pollinate and all these different kinds of things. There's, there's a lot to it, but it can be really simple and it can be really fun. So enjoy your gardening and guys, learn as much as you can about it because one day your life may totally depend on it. So thank you guys from Deep South Homestead.